Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Jude Blanchett, and I'm the Freeman Chair in China Studies here at CSIS. Uh, I'm really delighted to be uh, hosting this morning's discussion, which is the first public event we're holding under the auspices of our Interpret China project here at CSIS. Uh, the Interpret China project was launched earlier this year with gracious funding from the Ford Foundation and the Carnegie Corporation of New York. And the intention of the project is to enable a more comprehensive and nuanced discussion of China's development, China's rise, through the translation of a wide assortment of primary source materials, speeches, journal articles, conference summaries, social media videos, um, and while there is, of course, a lot of excellent translation already going on of primary source materials, we wanted to create a, a sort of one-stop shop um, where individuals could come and read documents, analyses, uh, speeches about uh, Chinese economic policy, about defense and foreign policy, how China is thinking through many of its environmental and energy challenges uh, it will face. And so in the spirit of that, we have uh, for the past month or so been translating a small selection of documents around the, the focus of our discussion today, which is the Global Security Initiative. First announced by Xi Jinping at the Boao Forum in April of this year. In my sort of intro remarks here, I'm, I'm, that's basically all I'm gonna say about it because the entire function of our discussion today is to dig a bit deeper into this and start filling in some of the initial gaps about how should we think about the Global Security Initiative, what we'll be referring today as the GSI, simply to save time. Um, what does it mean? What does it tell us about China's conception of the international order? What does it tell us about the future direction of Chinese foreign policy? What connections does the GSI have to Beijing's conception of domestic national security? This is a topic that I think we'll be around for a while, and I'm already starting to see lots of speculation, lots of space filling about what it is. Um, so this, I thought, would be a great moment to stop, um, uh, take a moment, engage with some of the primary source materials, and begin to uh, analyze what we know, what we don't know, and what are the questions we should be watching moving forward. And I'm really delighted to say that um, three friends and colleagues have agreed to take an hour and 15 minutes out of their hectic schedules to think through this with me. Um, three individuals who not only are taking an hour and 15 minutes out of busy schedules, but have also been incredibly supportive of the Interpret China project by agreeing to serve on our advisory board and offer um, guidance to shaping the project uh, along the way. So uh, really delighted to have Chino Greitens here who is an associate professor at the LBJ School of Public Affairs at the University of Texas at Austin. Taylor Fravel, who is the Arthur and Ruth Sloan Professor of Political Science and the director of the MIT Security Studies Program. And uh, dialing in somewhat late at night, uh, at least by my middle-aged standards, uh, is Manoj Kewaramani, who heads the China Studies Program and is chairperson of the Indo-Pacific Research Program at the Takshashila Institution. Uh, and as I'm sure many of you know, you, you wake up in the morning greeted by Manoj's uh, lengthy exegesis of, the, of that day's People's Daily. Um, so really delighted to have all three um, uh, individuals joining us. Just a very quick logistics note. Uh, if you go to um, the Interpret China website, or indeed if you go to the events page for this on the CSIS.org website, you will see the documents that we will be lightly touching on or referencing uh, throughout the discussion here. Um, you don't need to have read these uh, to enjoy the event, but if someone says something or if coming after this, you're, you're, you're curious and wanna read more, uh, please go to the Interpret China website where you will find, um, uh, find more information about this. And then finally, um, we believe in mass democracy here at CSIS, so we welcome participation from the audience in the discussion, there is on the events page on CSS.org a link you can click and you can input your questions. Um, I'll be looking at those uh, as they come in throughout the discussion and where they're apposite um, or value add, I, I will pose these to, uh, to the group. So we do welcome contributions from uh, audience members. 
So with that, uh, let's get right into the discussion. And I thought it might be helpful to start at the very highest elevation, which is just by asking the, our three panelists today at, at a broad level, um, based on the readings, but also the context within which the, the Global Security Initiative was announced um, just a few months after uh, Putin's invasion of Ukraine, uh, in the midst of intensifying US-China competition um, and, and in the midst of some significant foreign policy challenges and, and opportunities for China. What do you make of the Global Security Initiative at, at the highest level? Does it strike you as being um, novel, new, significant? Does it underwhelm you? Is it too early to tell? Just wanna get the, the high level of impressions and Manoj, cause you're, you're you're the square most immediate to me. Let, let me see if I can start with you, please. All right. Um, thanks. Thanks so much, Jude. And it's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to be talking about this. Um, uh, to begin with, I mean, my high level sort of thoughts on this is that, I mean, when I was reading through, when I've been reading through Xi Jinping's speeches and the uh, readings that we had, uh, I sort of looked at GSI from three different prisms. Uh, the first was a threat prism which I think is uh, very clearly pronounced in, you know, uh, every most Xi Jinping speeches today on the international situation begin with this sense of foreboding uh, about, you know, how the international environment has changed and how it's become far more challenging. The idea of, you know, uh, small groups, yards, exclusive yards and high walls, uh, and those sort of constraining China's room for maneuver, uh, its potential to rise, uh, and also creating parallel systems which may inhibit its uh, uh, potential to act internationally and constrain its actions. So there's a sense of foreboding and there's a sense of a threat which primarily sort of is the first prism that I would look at this. And that's why when you look at how he's framed GSI also, he's framed it largely in opposition to what he sees uh, as, you know, this Western-led international order which was set up after the Second World War. Um, so that's the sort of first prism that came to mind, and I can go into this later as we get into the conversation. The second prism that you know comes to my mind is a sense of opportunity. Uh, again, with most things in China, there's a threat and there's an opportunity, there's insecurity and there is hubris, those coexist. Um, and I think that there is that sense of opportunity which comes across uh, you know, the readings and Xi Jinping's comments, uh, not just around GSI, but otherwise also. Um, there is this sense that uh, you know, the West is in potentially terminal decline uh, and, you know, and the East is rising. Uh, the sense is that there is this profound shift that's taking place in the balance of power. Uh, and the China, despite all the threats that are accumulating, is still in a period of uh, strategic opportunities. That window has not entirely closed. Uh, and you need to do much more to ensure that that window remains uh, as far open as possible. And GSI is sort of one component of that. You know, um, the, and what makes it possible for him to do this, in his view, uh, seems to be the idea that there is tremendous material strength that has been accumulated. Uh, China's size, its economy, uh, its engagement with the world makes it an indispensable partner. Uh, so while you may want to constrain it, there are limits to what one can do. Uh, and all of this creates the opportunity for new equations and new relationships, um, particularly with large parts of the developing world um, and, you know, sort of to offer global public goods, reshape the international order while the West is in decline or the international sort of liberal international order has faded away. Uh, but you need to do much more. And sort of GSI fits into that idea of, you know, creating space for security, not just economic security, but political security for China. And the third prism that I look at this from is, you know, a moral prism. And I think some of the readings, particularly uh, Tian Wen Lin's piece, uh, makes it quite clear that there is a certain moral argument, uh, which I think is being used uh, not just externally to make the case to the rest of the world, uh, particularly the developing world and emerging economies, that there is something fundamentally diseased about the Western-led order, which has led to these security risks, which has led to, you know, it started with sort of foreign conquests and has then led to these security risks where uh, the sense of absolute security, the sense of othering, countries, the sense of creating ideological divisions leads to contradictions, which are going to end up re resulting in more security threats for other countries. And if you're not in the direct firing line, there are spillover effects which are going to affect you. 
Uh, and that's, I think, the Ukraine war and the sort of uh, the idea of spillover effects in terms of food security, energy security, uh, allows that point to be made much more emphatically. Uh, in comparison, I think uh, the piece that I referenced, uh, he talks about, you know, 300 odd years of peace in East Asia and a much more stable order. Uh, he talks about, uh, you know, Chinese values being a certain way. He talks about GSI being premised on core socialist values uh, and, you know, the idea of development and stability going together which obviously he contra contrasts with his version of so-called Western, Western international order. And I think that, like I said, partly that point is being made externally, but my sense is that partly that point is also being made for a domestic audience to uh, gather people around a much more activist Chinese security policy. So I'll stop with that and we can probably talk about that more later. Great, thank you, Manoj. Excellent opening comments. Uh, Sheena, if I may, I'd go to you next. Yeah, thanks. So, um, so first of all, I just wanted to um, to offer thanks to Interpret China and to CSIS to the Freeman Chair for um, for translating the documents that are online as part of today's event because I, I really do think those are kind of the key documents that we have so far to figure out what the global security initiative is, how the Chinese Party State is starting to think about and apply the the concepts that Xi Jinping has introduced starting in April. Um, and, um, and so I just, I think it's really, really helpful to have those translated and available widely at this point. Um, so, you know, the way that, that I see the, the global security initiative is, um, that there, there are still a lot of unanswered questions. Um, but I, I do think it has the potential to be a pretty significant initiative on the part of the, the Chinese party state to significantly revise global governance. And I think you can see it as connected to two other pieces uh, of, of an effort where we've seen some, some pretty significant push for revision on, on the part of, of Xi Jinping and the Chinese leadership. Um, the Global Security Initiative is following the Global Development Initiative and some other, um, you know, initiatives and proposals that China has put forward in the last couple of years to really revise global architecture and global governance across a range of issue areas, right? And so I think it's important to put the Global Security Initiative in the context of the Belt and Road Initiative, the, the Global Development Initiative, the Global Data Security Initiative that Wang Yi talked about. Um, not all of these have gotten equal traction in the international community, but I do think it's important to note that the Global Security Initiative itself is part of a larger whole. Um, or a larger package of initiatives in Chinese foreign policy, right? It's, it's not sort of the sole thing that Xi Jinping has put out there. Um, it's embedded in a sort of broader set of conversations about the inadequacy of global governance, the problems with existing international order, and China's role as a leader in proposing new solutions which could have and which do have the potential to pretty fundamentally revise that international order. Now, it is not in any way a straight line from that potential to these revisions of international order actually happening, let alone in exactly the way that China has proposed that they will happen, right? Um, intent is not activity by the party state is not impact uh, of, of these um, of these proposals on the international system. And, and I think we need to be very clear about, about differentiating those. But I, I do think that context, that broader context of the international order is flawed, it's not heading in a good direction. We need to really revise global governance. China has a whole suite of solutions that it's presenting is a really important piece of context here. The second piece of context that I think is really, really important to note when we think about what the Global Security Initiative is and what it could mean is that, and I'll, I'll kind of give you the top line here and then maybe we can come back to this in a, in a follow up, um, is that you know the sources um, that have gone into a little bit more depth and tried to expand on what does Xi Jinping mean in this speech that he gave, right? Um, most of which are, are the, the, I think, the, that Interpret China has provided the translations of the, the key documents that we have so far where this is starting to happen. We're starting to see this interpretation by, um, you know, actors like the Kicker um, the, and uh, CAS and some of these um, think tanks that are closely affiliated with various parts of the, the party state. 
Um, you know, what we see there is that there's being a, there's a very close link being drawn between the global security initiative and the comprehensive national security concept. And um, the comprehensive national security concept was, uh, this, is, this is something I've, I've been doing a lot of work on and have a book project on right now, but the comprehensive national security concept when it premiered in April of 2014 was also really vague in its initial rollout. And I think because it was so vague, um, because it was a sort of a, you know, um, a slogan and a concept without necessarily a lot of actionable substance right away. Um, I actually think a lot of external observers, probably myself included, missed how significant the comprehensive national security concept was going to be. Um, and it really produced a wholesale overhaul, uh, both of, um, of China's domestic security apparatus. 20 plus different domestic security laws, reorganization of things like the, the role of the People's Armed Police, um, the discipline and supervision apparatus, the anti-corruption campaign was linked to the comprehensive national security concept, um, you know, changes to ideological education, discussions of ideological security, um, policy in Xinjiang was sort of um, framed as the test case for the comprehensive national security concept, right? So, so this concept was vague at the beginning, but it ended up having a tremendous impact on China's domestic and in some cases foreign policy. Um, you know, Xi Jinping a little bit later by 2017 was telling the Ministry of Public Security that they needed a global vision in, in national security work and the Ministry of Public Security has dramatically expanded its, its international activity as a result. Um, so I think you know, the fact that we're seeing this link drawn between the global security initiative and the comprehensive national security concept tells us that just because this is vague right now doesn't mean that it's not going to be pretty consequential because um, the comprehensive national security concept was also vague, ended up having a really be producing this pretty thorough overhaul of internal security policy, organizations, laws, actual policies and behavior. Um, and so I think, you know, the fact that the GSI is being framed as the external manifestation of the comprehensive national security concept suggests to me that the leadership has now linked it to something that really A, has to succeed and B, has to actually do something. Um, I don't think we know yet exactly what that's going to look like. We can talk a little bit more about, about that in the, the follow-up discussion. Um, but to me, the, the one big a sort of implication of the link that's been drawn between the comprehensive national security concept and the GSI is to say this is a real thing um, and it's important to the Chinese leadership that it's it's um, that it succeeds because it's now been linked to one of Xi Jinping's defining contributions for the party state and for Chinese history um, as the CCP frames it and sees it. Um, so I'll stop there and uh, and maybe we can pick back up on the, the links if there's more you want to know about that. But um, those two things, kind of the external con context of this broader framing of we need to change global governance and China has these answers. And then the link that's being drawn to a concept that has dramatically overhauled China's approach to domestic security, I think tell us that this could be a pretty significant initiative whether or not the party state can pull that off is kind of a separate question. Maybe we can talk about the challenges to that um, a little bit later, um, but I at least think that potential is there and that we should all be watching, all of us who are observing China from around the world should be watching pretty closely. Yeah, great. Thank you, Sheena. And, and definitely would like to return to um, that, that connection uh, with the national security concept. Um, Taylor, GSI, nothing burger, new plan for galactic domination, something in between what, what do you think um well it's very hard to follow um Minoj and, and sheena here and add, add something new but i guess I, I will put myself temporarily in the camp it's too soon to tell um and we could um um there, you know, there are two risks right? we could over interpret it or we could under interpret it so uh, let me just offer a few initial reactions um first right and she's speech is really only a paragraph right as a bullet point that has six sub points um, those six subpoints pretty much are, are all talking points that have uh, been used by Xi Jinping or China uh, for a very long time. So the, the, the lead talking point is going back to his 2014 Kika speech. 
the emphasis on sovereignty and territorial integrity, right, is the five principles of peaceful coexistence and so on and so forth. And so what we have here is, is the, the repackaging um, primarily of existing views of principles by which uh, international affairs should be conducted, labeled as the Global Security Initiative. The one element that struck me as somewhat new was the, the inclusion of this idea of indivisible security, which principally comes from Russia. And I couldn't really not find many Ministry of Foreign Affairs references to indivisible security in previous documents. But for on the whole, many of the other elements are not new in individually. Um, and so uh, what is interesting is how they're being packaged. Uh, but but again, uh, what does that what does that mean that China will do differently than what it has been doing before based upon these principles? Again, I think it's very hard, hard to say. Uh, the second point I would offer here is we there is an interesting translation issue since this is interpret China, right? So in Chinese, it's a Chang'e, which uh, China has translated as initiative. But if you look up Chang'e in the dictionary, right, it could be a suggestion, it could be a proposal, it could be something to advocate for. And at least the way Xi Jinping lays it out as the set of principles is sort of a proposal. Here is what we sort of think should guide international affairs versus what an action plan might be for China. If it was a plan, right, it might be uh, described as the global security Xiangmu or something like that, right? So I think the words here give China a lot of flexibility you know, to the previous points that were made in terms of how it will be developed. But you know, I, I think because the Belt and Road in English was described as, a, as an initiative, although interesting in, Chi in Chinese for a long time, it was not described as a Chang'e, right? It was just, you know, one belt, one road or obor, uh, that, that we may be instinctively thinking this is on par with the Belt and Road as something that China wants to pursue when they may not know yet. Um, third point here would be my other initial take was this is a con part of a continuing effort, right, to delegitimate the United States as a global security actor. And so it's very much uh, one reads either Xi's speech, the expositions by Lil Yu Chung or Wang Yi shortly thereafter, the readings that were translated, and it's very much, here's everything we dislike, principally actually about the United States, not even about the US-led order. I mean, it, it's sort of, that has been stripped away, and it's just look at how many wars the US has created, look at you know how much instability and suffering the United States has uh, sort of inflicted upon the world, and here is China with our you know, very sort of laudatory, vague principles about dialogue and consultations, and, and we're, we're just a much more stable actor that's really going to um, um, sort of bring more stability to the world and then allow the world to sort of pursue development. And so, you know, there's this great article um, uh, by Randall Schreller and uh, uh, Pu Xiaoyu from like 2011 about this idea of, uh, of how a rising power has to delegitimate sort of the dominant power. And I, I, I very much at the moment view the commentaries on the global screen is really as this effort to kind of delegitimate the United States. Uh, as an actor. And I would say it really follows from kind of a pretty sharp turn in Chinese sort of foreign policy rhetoric uh, in the 2019-20 timeframe when, you know, the U.S. started calling out China more. I think China returned by calling out the U.S. more. Now we're in this narrative battle to see, you know, with, with each side to see which actor is going to be the one who's going to create more, you know, more harm on the world. Uh, but, 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 but it's not necessarily, um, at the moment, it's hard to say if it would be more than that. Um, and if there, if, is there really an alternative vision? Um, it, it includes many other things like the community of common destiny, right? Uh, it's part of that. Uh, and so there's almost like this circular logic where, where you have these new initiatives that are part of old initiatives. Um, and there's almost like initiative fatigue. Now, on the one hand, these could all be the building blocks of, of, of a pretty systematic Chinese approach to international order and reform of global governance, um, as Sheena has mentioned. Uh, but I think it also has a more practical, short-term kind of uh, uh, delegitimate, uh, sort of effort to delegitimate the United States as U.S.-China relations might have become quite tense and are at a really low point from which it does not seem there will be, be much change. And so for these reasons, I think it's it's too soon to tell. We have to, you know, balance sort of not us here in this panel per se, but just everyone who's thinking about it, balance um, sort of disregarding it entirely uh, because there's nothing new versus saying because it's been described as an initiative, it must be a galactic plan um, because that's <laughs> what initiatives are. Otherwise, you wouldn't use the term. But when you talk about it in Chinese as a Chang'e, Chang'e's are less kind of action oriented and a bit more 
principled and moral, I think, to use Minoj's um, a very a fine uh, choice of words there. So um, those are my initial reactions and thoughts, and I'll I'll send it back to you. Yeah, thanks, Taylor. And something I'd like to ask the group um, later on is thinking about various audiences for the GSI. There's, as Sheena mentioned, there's a domestic component of this. There's um, uh, an external component. And so just building off of Taylor's point, something maybe we could circle back to later is whether it's a Changi or not, how are third countries perceiving uh, the, the GSI, um, I would imagine is going to play a large role in determining how important it is or is not. Is it the new Coke of, of security ideas, in which case there ain't no buyers for it? And um, uh, you know, was it John Pomfret calls China the land of soft openings? It's just yet another another slogan which has six months of runway and then and then uh, peters out just to continue mixing my metaphors. Taylor, if I could, before we move on to some of the other questions, I, I wonder if we could just linger on one point for a second, which is just on this um, this uh, idea that Xi Jinping borrows from Putin in point four of this variously translated as the sort of six commitments that Xi Jinping um, uh, lays out in his initial April speech. And just maybe I'll, I'll, the real, the real uh, basic summary of these for, for uh, folks listening is um, in, in that paragraph that Taylor mentioned from the Boao speech, it's really just a, a long set of clauses. And it's, you know, point number one is commitment to a vision of common, comprehensive, cooperative, sustainable security. Two is respect sovereignty and territorial integrity of all countries. Three, basically stay committed to purposes and principles of the UN Charter. Um, four is um, commitment to legitimate security concerns of all countries and uphold principle of individual security. Five is, is resolve disputes through discussion dialogue. Six is interestingly uh, security in both the traditional and the non-traditional uh, domains, which later I'd like to ask Sheena, that's a big component of the comprehensive national security outlook is thinking about non-traditional security domains. But Taylor, coming back to this, how do you interpret indivisible security insofar as why was it added here? This, of course, comes from Putin's idea that NATO expansion, um, uh, which came at the idea of security of the West, threatened the security of the entire region. So it's this idea of balancing you can't grab your security at the expense of, of the broader region. Does the inclusion here mean anything um, um, larger to you in terms of Xi Jinping borrowing you know, synergies between Russia and China, and we're now sort of trading back and forth you know, broader security architecture conceptions? Or is it Xi Jinping hears that and goes, you know what? What NATO is doing to Russia is what the US is doing to China and the Indo-Pacific. So uh, we're going to include this. No, that's a great question, dude. I think it's more of the latter than the former, at least uh, on uh, July, what is it, 14th, um, 2020, right? I mean, 2022, excuse me. I mean, th th this could change, but but I think I, I think it was viewed as a useful talking point, right? That that you that that countries have a or China believes right that countries should have a veto over what makes them more or less secure, and if they believe something makes them less secure, then that has to be taken into account, right? And this is the critique of NATO expansion, which right somehow caused the Russian invasion of Ukraine, right? Which is not an argument we want to get into today. Um, um, but but you could see how China would use this, like a you know United States of you. Uh, you know, take this action here, this undermines our security and, and therefore um, we're going to oppose it. And so I think in that sense, it's a very useful talking point. I don't th I think it doesn't highlight new issues where China would identify security threats, but it may be a different way of talking about them. And in that sense, it may um, help, uh, you know, propagate um, a different norm for security discourse since it's now being used uh, both by Russia and by China, which are two significant global powers. But I also think it's one uh, in this uh, broader effort of, you know, at least my view, right, or part one view of this as being a counter hegemony sort of critique of the United States, but right, is also very handy for any other country who believes that they've been wronged by US power, they can, they, they could, they could also bring this up, um, which to your, to your other point, I, I, I think, I, I think the global South, 
broadly defined is the major audience for this. Um, I don't think this is going to resonate much in Europe um, in, in the way in which um, China might hope, but I think it might resonate elsewhere. And I think because China has essentially alienated Europe uh, over the past 18 months, including its support for Russia and the invasion, uh, you know, Chinese diplomacy now really has to focus on the global South even more than before uh, if it wants to effectively kind of counter or balance against, against the United States. Um, so we'll have to see. I, I, think, I think tracking this idea of indivisible security, though, is important because it, in my view of these six components, that was the paragraph that jumped out or the clause, excuse me, that jumped out at me as being most kind of, oh, that, this is a little unfamiliar um, in sort of the, the, the rhetoric of sort of Chinese foreign policy. Thank you. Um, um, if I can, Sheen, I'd like to go to you at this point, because maybe we can now start, we, we started at 35,000 feet. I now actually wonder if we can flip this and start inward and sort of project out. Um, you're thinking more about the comprehensive national security outlook than anyone I know. Um, you, when, when I saw you a few weeks ago, mentioned that you thought that was one of the most striking things here was in the, again, the, the, the extent commentary, and we're all admitting we have few data points to work off here. And this is a, this is something we're, we're, um, you know, we're watching the air, the airplane being built as it's flying. So there's a lot of known unknowns and unknown unknowns and, and TBDs, but um, can you just unpack a bit more why this connection between the comprehensive national security outlook may be significant for thinking about where the GSI goes. And I wouldn't mind actually if you just spent a little bit more time sketching out how important the comprehensive national security uh, outlook has been as a driver or shaper um, of, of the way that the party state thinks about securing regime security domestically. And I should note that in some of the commentaries and um, there is this strong idea of uh, they call it a balance or a connection between domestic security and international security and finding some sort of dialectical balance between the two. So there's, there is already a clear linkage about how China secures its security at home and, and, and the way it will think about security abroad. So Sheena, can I just give you some space to kind of think through this and why it's important? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, so so yeah, one, I, as I mentioned in my sort of top line opening remarks, I, I think that one of the most, to me, one of the sort of biggest things that that has jumped out at me in reading some of the initial follow up commentary um, about the the GSI really is the link that's been drawn to the comprehensive national security concept and the sort of framing of GSI as the external manifestation and projection of the comprehensive national security concept. Um, I will say, just to be very clear, I agree with Taylor in the it's too soon to say with any kind of definitive interpretation where this is, is going exactly. And so we need to be, um, you know, appropriately intellectually and analytically humble here and revise, be willing to, you know, revise our priors every time we get new data, because we're likely to get a lot more data than we than we have right now. Um, and so I think um, it's just good to sort of go at this and and at the the next few months and maybe even a couple of years with with that sort of um, analytical approach. Um, but yeah, there there are a couple of features of the comprehensive national security concept that I think it's important to remember um, as we think about uh, the global security initiative. If it is in fact sort of an external manifestation and projection of the comprehensive national security concept. Um, First is that it, the comprehensive national security concept is fundamentally a political security concept about the, the security of the, the CCP, right? Um, if you look at, you know, comprehensive national security is really broad. It encompasses a dozen different, you know, issue areas and, and domains from environmental to financial to, you know, territorial and military security. Um, but what Xi Jinping just has defined as the sort of the the heart's blood and the foundation of national security is political security, which is in turn defined as the security of China's socialist system, um, the leadership of the CCP, and um, the leadership in particular of the, the Communist Party Central Committee with Xi Jinping at the core. 
I'm not getting that language quite right, but there's um, it's very clear that um, you know this is really a, a party state and a regime security concept. And so if what we're seeing is the idea that that's being projected, um, you know, now internationally, I think it's just important to remember that that is in, in fact what what is being sort of um, extended ab abroad. Um, the second thing, and the, the documents on the GSI are actually really um, do explicitly echo this, at least the one by the, the CAS researcher, um, uh, talk about the fact that, the, that security in this sense is not only material, but ideological. Um, and it is about legitimation. And so I think this gets to the question of, is the GSI going to be primarily an exercise in delegitimating the United States um, delegitimating possibly the broader US-led security order, um, or is there going to be sort of some more concrete manifestation of that in organizations, law, policy, et cetera? Um, I, I, so I think that that legitimation point is, is a really important one and, and share the, the comments made by some of the other panelists about how important that is. I think there's, a, there's still an open question about how that's going to translate into some more concrete security initiatives. Um, but it's interesting to see that the, the sort of language about ideological security um, also being sort of echoed and picked up in, in the, the GSI, the discussion of the, the GSI. Um, second, and this really jumped out in, in, at me in one of the commentaries, um, I think it was also the one by the, the CAS researcher, um, is that the secure condition of a country includes, you know, not only objective security, but a sense or a perception of security. And that caught my attention in part because I've spent a long time studying um, and looking at how leaders of non-democracies perceive security. And it doesn't always correlate with objective security very well. Um, so my first book looked at Taiwan, South Korea, and the Philippines, right? Not communist systems. Um, and then I've spent a lot of time looking at China and North Korea and other, um, uh, you know, communist non-democracies. Um, and if the claim here is that the Chinese leadership not only has to be objectively politically secure in its hold on power, but has to feel secure, we're going to have some bumpy moments because most autocracies inherently seem to feel insecure, right? I can't think in reading through, you know, tons of reports on non-democratic leaders, um, whether you're talking about, you know, Chiang Kai-shek in Taiwan or some of South Korea's military authoritarian leaders or Saddam Hussein in Iraq, right? These folks just never felt safe. They never felt secure. And so if it strikes me as potentially problematic, and we don't know yet that this is going to happen, this is one commentary by somebody who's not in the party state, they're at a think tank affiliated with it. Um, so I think we have to be careful not to overinterpret, to Taylor's point. Um, but this idea that China has to subjectively feel secure could end up being pretty problematic, given what we know about non-democracy's subjective threat perceptions historically. That's an almost impossible bar to meet. Um, so, so this idea that it's you know, ideological security and also sort of subjective perception of security strike me as, as pretty important and potentially problematic. Um, Third, you know, the, the comprehensive national security concept was very clear that internal and external security were closely linked. And so the comprehensive national security concept dealt with that primarily by looking at and, and bodies like the, you know, the Central National Security Commission, um, the party body that, that coordinates national security work for the CCP. Um, you know, traditionally when it's met, when it's held big meetings, it's been to look at how external events impact regime security, impact the domestic stability and the internal security of the of the party state. Um, and so there's always this interesting question, well, what is what is the comprehensive national security concept actually mean for foreign policy? And I think the GSI is is starting to provide some of those answers. But again, we're still in kind of the conceptual framework, the slogan stage, the legitimation um, argumentation phase. We don't yet know how that's going to translate exactly into action. Um, 
And then I, I think the last, but, but again, I think, you know, it's not surprising to me to see this because the comprehensive national security concept always drew a really strong link between internal and external security and argued that they were mutually interlocking and could be sort of mutually activated. Um, so, um, it always struck me that the, the comprehensive national security concept didn't quite have enough of an answer on, okay, what does that mean for foreign policy? So I, in the, the fact that the GSI is being framed as a sort of follow up and, and, and an answer to that question, I, I think is not surprising, but again, potentially consequential. Um, and then, you know, I think the, the last point is this point about non traditional security, Jude, that, that you raised. Um, that's been really important in the comprehensive national security concept. What that has meant in practice is often um, a use of sort of non military tools to address particular security challenges in particular, um, you know, one of the things it's meant, and I, I hinted at this earlier, is the expansion of PRC law enforcement activity abroad um, and an expanded global international role for um, the political legal system in China. Um, and so I think, um, you know, we have a tendency sometimes to look at At Chinese security, all security, DOD and the United States military are sort of, you know, the, the often the major um, actor. Um, but I think we need to remember that that for China, um, security sometimes can mean actions taken by the Ministry of Public Security abroad, um, not necessarily the, the PLA, and that often the actor in charge of securing a security interest um, might well not be the, the PLA at all, but that's still framed as a national security imperative on the, the part of the party state. And so we can't overlook um, some of those those activities um, simply because they're they're not military and it doesn't quite mirror the way we think about and operationalize national security abroad. Um, and then, the, the, you know, the final thing is is just to say, and again, this isn't this is currently an unanswered question, right? Um, it was not clear when Xi Jinping announced and rolled out the comprehensive national security concept, right? People initially thought that the Central National Security Commission was going to look more like the United States National Security Council or the National Security Council that, Jap that Japan was, was setting up. Um, but um, it took a couple of years, right? Um, so this was a concept, it was this set of ideas that were kind of vague. In many ways, it also repackaged, to Taylor's point earlier, it also repackaged things that we had heard before about um, national security um, for in previous parts of, of Chinese history and political rhetoric. Um, but that repackaging into a coherent national security framework turned out to be an intellectual architecture that did translate into pretty significant organizational reforms, legal reforms, and policy changes for the party state. Um, again, you know, so for example, China had never written down a what it called a national security strategy until 2015, right? And it's now done two. There was one, there was the one in 2015, which was the first ever national security strategy. Neither of them are public. Um, and then there was one that was um, approved last fall for the next five years. Um, so that that did fundamentally change the, the policy process as well for national security policymaking um, in ways that I think we don't fully understand. Um, so, you know, my base, the, the, the reason I'm mentioning this, right, is that my baseline is that if the GSI follows the comprehensive national security concept model, we're not going to see the sort of concrete manifestations uh, in terms of security architecture, organizational restructuring. We're going to see this sort of rhetoric and attempt to get buy in on these concepts to think through intellectually what this framework means first. And then we'll see how it translates into policy. Right. And I agree that the, you know, even the, the use of the what's been translated as initiative really has left the CCP some pretty wide latitude to, to decide where it's gonna take this. Um, but I would also just note that we shouldn't have expected that the rollout of the concept 
was going to be immediately followed by a set of concrete action items, right? That's just not the way that the party state tends to do it, these kinds of things, at least if you take the comprehensive national security concept as the, the baseline. Um, so I don't think we probably will see exactly what this means in terms of concrete reforms and action changes to global governance um, for maybe a year or two. Um, but I think, you know, again, because that potential's there, because we have this precedent of something that was vague at the beginning that turned out to be very, you know, concretely and materially consequential, um, I do think it, it's really worth watching, um, even if that's still sort of a, a question and a potential rather than a, a foregone conclusion. Um, I've, just, I've talked for quite a while, so I'll stop there and, and let you follow up if anything I've said is unclear or incomplete, Jude, but thanks. No, that was great. Um, Sheena, I think that was a really good foundation to build off of in terms of what are some of the domestic emanations um, of, of the GSI. And I was also thinking as you were speaking, we're in this liminal period where the center puts out a broad construct. Scholars in China now get into the scrum and try to you know, shape it, figure out what it is. And so these commentaries that we've translated, although they're sparse, and of course are not determinative. I, what I find interesting about them is they reflect how better positioned scholars, um, the signals that they're picking up and, and either what they hope this will become or, or what their antennas are picking up in terms of what the drivers, you know, what the drivers and possible future trajectory. So, you know, as you read these documents, you've got to triangulate your, your radar precise such that you're not taking these as gospel but you're also seeing these as important signals of what actors, you know, closer to the center, how they are interpreting that vague paragraph from Xi Jinping. Plus, by the way, undoubtedly going on right now are closed door study sessions where we're studying the glorious speech of Xi Jinping at the Boao Forum. And as Franz Sherman said, you know, in his classic book, those study sessions are really where meaning is put on vague concept. It is the regular, discussion interpretation of party biblical texts where you begin to extract like the deep core meaning. So interestingly, I think there probably is no end definition of this and that's not a defect of this. This is, an, an, this is a feature of the system where it will be iterations and evolutions over, over time. So um, I think we're all saying the same thing of kind of too early to tell, but nonetheless, um, not the thing, one where meaning will evolve over time. So continuing to take these snapshots will be important to see um, where there has boom and where there has not. Um, I'm gonna zoom around a bit, Manoj, if I can um, now go to, I think really Taylor mentioned this earlier on and I think this will be one of the key pillars. So China's trying to figure out what it's selling um the supply side of this what's the demand side of this um you're in bangalore um so um you know you're you're i'm gonna now officially dub you as the as the mediator for the entire global south um how do you think this will be received obviously there's both cynicism and alarm in what i would call western capitals who either see that you know see this, I think to some extent rightly as a as an assertive effort by China to delegitimize and shape the global governance in ways that may be zero sum with the United States. How do you think countries in your region and projecting farther out Southeast Asia, how might they be interpreting the GSI if they're thinking about it at all? But if they are and if they're seeing the message, how receptive do you think they will be to um, what China is offering? Right. Um, okay, so I'll get to that. I just had a few thoughts before with some of the things that we've already discussed. Um, so I agree that I think a lot of it at present is sort of delegitimizing the United States. Uh, but I think that there is uh, uh, far more uh, that's, you know, going on. And that's partly going back to Sheena's point about, you know, looking at BRI, GSI, GDI as a whole. Um, and uh, I think that uh, if you look at that, there's a little bit more that's going on. Um, I, I say this partly because, you know, global, the Global Development Initiative was sort of officially proposed in September last year. And very recently, we had that high level dialogue on development. Uh, and that led to some sort of 
concrete, albeit somewhat underwhelming, but some sort of concrete measures being announced. Um, you know, there's a bunch of areas that that initiative, uh, that that meeting led to, where the Chinese said things like, you know, we're going to uh, cooperate with other countries in eight areas, from poverty reduction, food security, health security, uh, development finance, climate change, uh, you know, digital connectivity, and so on. There was a specific segment there about, uh, you know, coordinating energy policies to make sure that uh, access to affordable energy for developing countries is ensured. So. And I think I see sort of the paths of the global security initiative, which some of the readings also bring out, uh, you know, the idea of non-traditional security. And these are the domains of some of the domains of non-traditional security, where I think you will see far more resonance in the global south. You know, uh, I think the last couple of months uh, with the war in Ukraine, the impact on food prices, the impact on commodity markets, the impact on energy uh, across the global south has been a huge concern. We've seen a tremendous upheaval in you know India's neighborhood in Sri Lanka. What's going on right now? Uh, we've seen tremendous economic challenges in Pakistan. Um, India itself is struggling with inflation. So I think that there is that aspect of it, depending on how that's worked out and what are the sort of specifics that are worked out, will find resonance. Um, in terms of uh, beyond that, in terms of sort of you know, the argument of delegitimizing the West, uh, I think that you will see far more caution. Uh, and I think that's where, uh, you know, there will be actors who may be far more comfortable with that, but there will also be actors who will see that dynamic as being pushed into choosing sides. You know, uh, if, if, if Asian countries don't want to choose sides, when the United States is asking them to choose sides, they wouldn't want to choose sides even when Beijing is asking them to. They essentially want to make sure that their interests are met. Um, and, you know, and essentially both powers arrive at some sort of an agreement, some sort of a working relationship as much as possible, uh, despite their sort of challenges. So I think that that aspect of it will actually not, would not necessarily enthuse a lot of the countries within the region. A lot of them may go on uh, to sort of acknowledge the fact that GSI is valuable because it delivers and it links to certain tangible practical benefits with regard to energy security, food security and other areas. Now, again, even on say energy security, it, it, it remains to be seen how that's interpreted. Are you going to interpret it as you know some sort of a, this has been attempted in the past, at least conversations have happened as some sort of a buying buyer's cartel. Uh, you know, to try and have a better negotiating position. Um, you know, those have not worked out in the past. Uh, could we see something like that? Uh, on food security, could we see something different that's worked out? I think if some of those areas, you'll find far greater buy-in on things like uh, delegitimizing the United States in the West, you might find sort of uh, a rhetorical nod with sort of uh, uneasy rhetorical nod if there are certain practical needs that are being made. Um, but on things like, security cooperation or uh, say with policing and law enforcement i'm not certain how how far beijing will go with that on its own and also how receptive other countries will be uh, there are aspects of it that may work but for example um, for the last few months there's been a conversation between beijing and islamabad uh, about uh, terrorism you know it's not a new conversation it's been happening for a long period of time yet we've not really seen that materialize into something substantial. Uh, it's it's still largely uh, Pakistani uh, security forces which are taking care of Chinese projects. Um, yes, there's a far greater sort of coordination. There's far greater. There's some presence also, but it's not materialized in some sort of a formal mechanism where you're seeing Beijing formally engage uh, in law enforcement, even if it is to just protect its own sort of institutions. Yes, there are Chinese security agencies that are involved, but it's not in the sense of the state being involved. Um, on issues of political security, again, I'm not necessarily certain of how much of appetite there is in China to do some of these things. Uh, I'll give you two examples. We saw, uh, you know, the situation in Kazakhstan a couple of in January this year. Uh, Beijing was fairly slow to react to that. Uh, it may have not felt the need to react to it immediately, uh, given that Russia did react to it. Uh, yet it was fairly slow to react to it, and even the mechanisms that Russia used were not the SEO. Uh, so I think that, you know, that's to me, that's an indicator of also appetite uh, and willingness. Uh, also, what's currently happening in Sri Lanka, I think Beijing has been woefully slow to react to it and actually sought to somewhat take a hands off approach in some ways, right? The fact that it's been reaching out to India saying that, look, we'd like to work with you guys. And, you know, uh, it tells you that the, the appetite may not necessarily be there 
to engage in far broader security uh, you know cooperation will gsi sort of engage, uh, result in some sort of uh, training program some sort of capacity building uh, whether it be for traditional policing and law enforcement whether it be for you know uh, digital governance uh, you know and the use of digital tools for law enforcement perhaps uh, would would some of that be far more appetizing for people in the global south perhaps um, but i don't think that you know uh, a greater presence of chinese security personnel uh in other countries would be something that would be necessarily welcome um the other area where i think that uh, and i think this is already be also, also been referred to is the idea of you know shaping rules um i think that's from the reading some of the things that one can gather is that there are certain areas and domains which are being talked about as key where you, one wants to shape rules um again i'm not sure how much of buy-in and how much of you know agreements uh Beijing can get on these, but uh, I think it, it's, we shouldn't be looking at some of these discussions from the point of view of an, a concrete agreement being arrived. But I think we should look at uh, this as Beijing negotiating with a bunch of countries to uh, uh, expand, to sort of strengthen its position, say, at institutions like the United States, United Nations, on issues like terrorism, nuclear security, space security, uh, maritime security you know, cyberspace, uh, the fact that you want to set new rules for these domains, or you want to shape future rules in these in these domains, getting countries on your side, because numbers matter at the United Nations and other places, getting countries on your side is, I think, one of the ways to do this. And so rather than looking at outputs and outcomes, uh, we should look at agreements, uh, tacit agreements, which impact conversations that say the United Nations on future rules. Uh, and I think GSI sort of perhaps will be used in that sense. Um, so yeah, that's what I think. Taylor, I have a I have a specific question for you, but want to give you a moment. If there's anything said thus far in the conversation, you had any thoughts or comments before I put a, a specific question to you? No, I was just going to flag that I meant to mention this earlier, but uh, but China did include GSI or references to it in the BRICS meeting, right? So there there is clearly an effort to get it out there, um, and we should we should fully expect that maybe to, it starts getting incorporated into joint statements and all the rest of it as a way of making it a thing right um um but that's just a side a side observation um the question i want to ask you taylor was uh i think back in january um i think a part of the interpret china i should remember this if i organized it but uh i think we held a discussion looking at the the china russia relationship where he translated a bunch of articles. And of course, at the time there was speculation, but no confirmation that Putin was gonna invade uh, um, Ukraine. And I think at the time you and I had had an offline with a few other people, offline discussion about, are we about to see a new era of the US or China Russia relationship, or, or does China have very narrow, discrete material interests and is looking to stay out of this? I don't wanna rehash that. I would imagine probably both of us on July 14th have found evidence to confirm our priors uh, about that about that discussion. Um, I wanted to reference one of the documents that we had translated as part of this was Wang Yi was participating in this China Russia think tank summit along with Sergey Lavrov, and um, in in his speech at, at this uh, think tank dialogue, he said. China is willing to work together with Russia, with the Russian side to continue implementing the important consensus of their two heads of state and push the development of the global governance system in a fairer, more just and more reasonable direction in four areas. Um, I, the four are concepts of democracy, which of course coming from Russia and China, um, I would imagine I'd put in the delegitimization bucket, watering down conceptions of democracy, as they say quite explicitly, there's no one model, you know, others can decide how they want to define democracy. Um, development, um, uh, a concept of, of the international order based on equality and respect. But the one I wanted to ask you is the fourth one, which is um, cooperation with Russia on security. Um, Again, without without getting into a whole larger, is the China Russia relationship a marriage of convenience or not? I wanted to ask, in in a narrow, discrete sense, and linking it to our discussion of the Global Security Initiative, in light of Putin's invasion of Ukraine and whatever we want to say about it, Russia or China certainly hasn't gone completely scurrying away from 
Russia. Um, where do you see the potentiality of Russia and China's cooperation on security as it relates to global governance? In light of the GSI, you know, uh, Wang Yi's comments here, is this aspirational? Is this just normative positioning? Or is there the prospect or possibility of, of China-Russia cooperation in the security realm beyond what we've seen thus far? You know, we, we've seen joint exercises over the past, since the invasion of, of Ukraine on two occasions. Is it just more of that or, or might there be a inflection in the in the steepening of the curve? Um, great question, Jude. And I do remember that conversation back in January, which we actually we should revisit. That would be a very interesting exercise. Um, so I guess a couple of quick thoughts. Um, as far as I can tell so far, right, the global security initiative is, is coming out of the foreign policy system in China, right? The Wai Jiao Shitong. It's not coming out of uh, the broader national or state security system. I think I maybe Sheena has a different sense if that's if it's been linked to the National Security Commission. Um, and, and there don't seem to be a lot of PLA discussions about it. And so, which means, right, that if if we're thinking about what this means in a Russia uh, China sort of cooperative context, it would probably mean increased cooperation in non-military security areas, uh, recognizing fully, right, that there will be continued military cooperation between the two in the form of the joint exercises that you that you reference. But that basically belongs to a different <clears throat> or would be sort of labeled as a different stream of activity because the foreign ministry, right, has no authority essentially over the PLA, given the way that uh, the party state is constructed. Um, and so I would expect the security cooperation that might follow between China and Russia from this or through that joint statement to be, you know, much of maybe what we've already seen before, but but the intensity could increase in terms of joint actions in the UN, right? So the UN is highlighted here as, as a key pillar for China, in part because China has veto power and in, in part because it's it's global and and Russia is, of course, a key uh, uh, ally and partner for China in that particular institution and, and in other similar institutions that have universal membership. And so I, I think it would primarily be in those areas, but um, where we might see what Wang Yi was talking about, because he really wasn't talking about military security cooperation. Um, I think he was talking about the sort of broader conception in terms of, or, or at least the diplomatic element of military security issues. Um, and the war in Ukraine, though, makes this challenging because, right, the contradictions in China's position on Ukraine are are evident in in in, in two of the components of the global security initiative, i.e., respect for sovereignty, actually territorial integrity, the UN Charter, and indivisible security. Right, that is a circle that not be that cannot be squared, no matter how much uh, Chinese wisdom is brought to bear um, on it. Um, and so, so. You know, I think depending on the audience, right, uh, one one of those components might be stressed the more. But but I, I don't think that this uh, foreshadows necessarily a step change increase. I mean, clearly Wang Yi was speaking at a meeting of Russian and Chinese think tanks. And so we we'll talk about Russia, uh, China cooperation. I would expect that to be said in that setting. But it, it's again, I don't mean to fall back on it's too soon to tell, but 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 but, but like. You know, like we often talk more broadly, right? You, you just can't look at what people say. You have to look at what they do. And so, you know, China's been saying a lot so far, and I think we need to look more at, at what they're going to do. And I think in the short term, Russia will be so consumed with prosecuting the war in Ukraine that there's not going to be a lot of extra space, I would imagine, for truly new security initiatives with China outside of the military domain. But um, but that that's just a gut instinct I could certainly certainly be 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 wrong. So you'd have trouble working at a DC think tank if you're hesitant to make wild uh, uh, wild and unfounded uh, suppositions uh, with very little evidence. Uh, that, that's so, why that, that's why, why I work at a university. <laughs> that's why I work at a think tank, Taylor. It's a nice yin and yang combination. Yes. Um, so we've we've just got about 10 minutes left. So I'm going to ask Taylor a um, not a quick question. I'm going to ask Taylor one quick question and then I was maybe just go around the horn for any any final thoughts um, that folks might have about the GSI. And I think especially any thoughts that we might have for what we should be looking out for. I think there's definitely a consensus that I've heard amongst the three of you 
different flavors of it, but I think a core consensus of we, we can't come to any firm conclusions. We're seeing sort of some initial movement in some directions, but you don't know if that's just a stutter step or if that's a stride in, in any new direction. So I might, after this question, Taylor, ask if folks just want to help us, analysts who are watching this, what should we be looking for? What are the key challenges the Global Security Initiative is going to face? Um, um, the, the amount of control China has over domestic security is, is more significant than its ability to control international um, events. Um, so there's going to be a lot of exogenous shapers of the GSI that are outside of Beijing's control. So kind of what are some of the hurdles um, that, that GSI may be facing? But Taylor, before I get turn around to everyone quickly, the, the question I was going to ask you is, um, you, you've when you testified in front of the USCC, you did a really insightful long paper on the framework or construction of profound changes on scene in a century and what it tells us about Beijing's shifting conceptualization of, as Manoj referenced earlier, this kind of window of strategic opportunity and its assessment of various international uh, threats. Does the GSI, if you were rewriting that paper again, would you bring in a discussion of the GSI or does it not fundamentally add anything new to how we think about China's perception of the international environment? That's a great question. So, you know, in terms of profound changes, right, there's an inherent contradiction. On the one hand, the world's sort of much more ominous, as Manoj uh, described, but on the other hand, China is stronger. And so some people view that as, you, you can basically read that in two different ways, right? That, 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 that China's on the rise and it can deal with all these challenges or all these challenges are, are are, are ones that China does not have an answer to in, in the short term and therefore right, re really needs to sort of focus more on policy responses. And so I guess I'm still more of the view that you know, this rhetoric of profound changes means that China is quite concerned about uh, the future international environment and its ability to pursue its interests, uh, even as a singular state. Um, and if it you know, despite the fact that it's strong, right, the challenges are always highlighted first, um, um, which makes me think that, that those are probably um, uh, most important. And so I definitely see GSI as a way of, of trying to perhaps have a more coherent response to the way in which China's environment is deteriorating, and I think continuing to deteriorate from its standpoint, um, right? China's not in a great place I think right now, um, uh, internationally, the way it's, it's positioned itself, I referenced earlier how I think it has probably fully alienated most of Europe um, in the last 18 months, which was a, a key pillar of its counter US kind of strategy. And that's sort of a self inflicted wound by Beijing, but nevertheless uh, means that it has kind of less, a fewer friends than it thought it might have and less room for, for maneuver. And so I think in that context, I would certainly see. Uh, the development of GSI perhaps as, as a way of providing a framework or an intellectual framework for how to uh, sort of deal with these different challenges and to improve uh, China's uh, position overall. I mean, the but but this comes out, especially I think in the, I wanna say that the Tian Wenlin um, uh, essay, right? I mean, it's it, it's a pretty ominous account of the world. And and even though he notes that uh, China is stronger, it seems like, like but the danger is outweighing the capability, right? Uh, to deal with those dangers and something more is needed. Thanks. Thanks, Taylor, that was great. Uh, so we just really have a few minutes left. So uh, uh, I hate to do this, but to ask a big question and ask you to answer it in a, in a rapid amount of time. But, you know, Sheena, let me start with you. Any final thoughts with an eye towards what should we be looking out for as we track this moving forward and, and any notable kind of hurdles or, or, or factors that you think we should be looking at that might have a demonstrative effect in shaping it? No, I was so glad that you asked the, the sort of the demand side question, because to me, that's one of the big unanswered questions is, you know, how much traction China's arguments about the illegitimacy of the United States as a security actor and the need for revision of global security governance you know, what, what is the global appetite for that? I don't think it's evenly distributed across the globe and across the countries of the international system. So, you know, I'll be looking at how would we know if this messaging and these efforts at legitimation are getting traction and where? 
Um, I actually think that measurement challenge is a really difficult and important one. And I, I don't think we've got a handle on how to answer that question, but it is going to be, I think, a, a really important one in the coming um, months to a few years. Um, in a second, as I, I said, I think continuing to read the kinds of commentaries that Interpret China has translated just to give us a sense of the context. Yes, not all of these sources are authoritative, but if we start to see, you know, repeated themes, repeated mentions of particular either framings or more concrete suggestions emerging from that discourse, right? I think we need to be watching for, even in this sort of, you know, official adjacent space, um, which is what we, what, the, where a lot of our data points are, are more fleshed out data points are coming from right now, right? If they're all pretty consistent um, over time, then I think we have, you know, a higher level of certainty about kind of where, how this is being interpreted, what, where the discussions are going. Um, whereas if we start to see more disagreement or things that get said once and not really sustained, you know, that's also going to be important. So kind of watching this official adjacent um, discourse, I think, is, is going to be really important in the near term because I don't know that we're going to have much else to go on um, for the next year, year and change. Um, and, um, and then finally is, is just to start thinking about what actual policy proposals, if any, do we see emerging in the next year or two? Um, like I said, I wouldn't expect much to happen necessarily before that, um, but I, I do think if this is going to actually result in a push for revision concretely of global security governance and quote unquote international order beyond the ideological, beyond the legitimation uh, sort of dimension, um, then, you know, I'll be watching to see if we start to get some of those proposals and how diplomats actually start incorporating this into policy positions in international institutions or bilateral meeting readouts or things like that. Um, how is this actually going to start affecting day-to-day -day conduct? Of, um, and, and so those are probably the three things that I'll be watching going forward, uh, just as sort of indicators of, of what this might mean and where it's going. Awesome. Thanks, Gina. Uh, Manoj, 60 seconds or less. What, any 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 parting thoughts, things we, you're going to be watching out for? All right. So I was going to say that I also work at a think tank and I'm prone to engaging in wild speculations. So, <laughs> so I'm going to do some of that. Um, so my sense is that, look, uh, I don't think we should be looking at an institutional architecture being created. Uh, I think you should look at this as a big sort of piece of puzzles uh, puzzle pieces which sort of come together potentially create some sort of a vague hole, but I don't think we should be looking at an institutional architecture being created. Um, uh, I don't think that's on the cards at the moment, at least. I, I don't also think that we should be thinking of, I mean, I'm not, I've not seen China underwrite security in conflict zones. Uh, I don't think that the appetite to do that continue, exists at present also. Um, you know, a couple of weeks ago, at the end of June, there was a Horn of Africa peace conference that the Chinese led. Um, if you look at what's come out of that, uh, there are commitments of talks, but there are there's a greater focus on things which are sort of non-traditional security from terrorism to, you know, natural disasters, drought, flooding, you know, food security, locust infestation, all those sorts of things. I, I think the focus of uh, this initiative, at least at its initial stages, will be more on domains of non-traditional security, trying to look at practical areas in which you can work with, uh, you know, the global south, develop the developing world, um, uh, because there are concerns that have come out. And I think in that they've leveraged what's happened in the last couple of months with the war in Ukraine and the impact that that's had uh, on the developing world. Uh, and I think that's the tangible area where I can see uh, this playing out. Um, in terms of I, I, in terms of security, I don't think this is, this, it, I don't think we're likely to see anything new immediately. Um, uh, from a demand side point of view, I think, uh, you know, South, this part of the world, the Indian subcontinent is a complex region. Uh, if you, you know, much more complicated than say this, uh, you know, the Pacific Islands. Uh, if you look at that area also, you saw that there wasn't, there was pushback, you know, uh, to, to greater security cooperation. So I don't think the demand side 
or at least some of those types of cooperation exist as 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 much as we might think. Um, so therefore, I think that you'll see much more focus on uh, practical issues of uh, development and security linked to development. Um, the only other space where I think that you will see. Uh, and this may be just a repackaging of things, is uh, an attempt to sort of normalize greater Chinese security presence through things like, you know, uh, you know, humanitarian and disaster relief operations and things like that, which is an ongoing process. And I think you'll see much more of that. You could package that at the GSI. Taylor, final benedictions? Uh, so I agree with everything my colleagues have said. I'll just say the one, <clears throat> one thing I'm going to look for is how this is described in the uh, work report at the upcoming Party Congress. Yeah. That should hopefully give us a sense of if there is more more attached to it or 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 if it is basically the six principles uh, that we've seen. Thanks. Great. Well, um, uh, as expected, that was a really um, that was a really rich um, conversation that I think was as we've flagged 800 times in the discussion with the limited data inputs we have. Um, I think that was both as as careful uh, as you can be, but also as forward looking. Um, and tentative um, as we could be. What are some of the early indicators that we should be watching for? Um, what are some of the antecedents of the domestic side thinking about the comprehensive national security uh, outlook? Um, uh, and then as we've just heard some key questions about looking at the demand side for this, how is this being received? Um, uh, how is this being perceived as a as a concept as a concept as a muddier of the waters? And then finally, for you know all of us here in the United States, um, if there is a receptive audience for the Global Security Initiative, we might want to think of that more on what we can control, which is if folks are looking to buy this, that may be because they're seeing what we're selling uh, as an expired product. So um, as much as we watch this closely, we might want to start thinking about which product line we're putting out um, and how we can revise this to meet the, the needs and demand of, uh, of uh, partners uh, who are looking for practical solutions to really challenging problems that uh, may be at lower elevation than great power competition, but more geared to COVID-19, economic development, environmental governance. Um, so anyway, I want to thank everyone for, for attending uh, this inaugural Interpret China uh, discussion. Uh, I want to thank uh, Manoj, Taylor, and Sheena for their time and their support for the project. And I uh, want to thank everyone for tuning in and look forward to seeing you all uh, at a future Interpret China event or uh, seeing those uh, massive amounts of clicks at the Interpret China website as you exploit the heck out of this, this public good. Uh, underwritten by Ford Foundation and the Carnegie Corporation uh, of New York. So thanks everyone and, and have a really wonderful Thursday.